more now from eCancer TV with George Canellos, Harvard, Boston. Uh, George, you've been in hematologic malignancy for quite a while. We've been to a lot of uh, ASH meetings uh, like this one yes, here yes, in yes. Orlando. Uh, but I, I'm interested to know what, from your point of view, are some of the hot topics. I know you've been to some of the Hodgkin's disease topics. Now, yes. Uh, d tell me, what, what's your feeling about what's happening here? Well, what's happening is that the importance of prospective randomized trials to change from what is standard therapy to something new before people leap to go to something new, uh, I think the, the whole world depends on prospective randomized trials. Now, at this particular meeting, uh, a regimen that has the name Stanford 5, which is uh, really 12 weeks of chemotherapy, modified dose, and then obligate radiotherapy to anything that was five centimeters or bigger um, is, was compared to standard treatment, ABVD, with or without radiation, and it turned out to be not superior. Now, you're talking about the abstracts from uh, Ranjana Advani looking yes, at yes. local bulky disease, and, and, and then there's Gordon. another one, Leo Gordon, Gordon. Yes. At Northwestern. Yes, it, there, uh, it was the same that? study. She just peeled off the bulky stage twos, uh, and, and basically, the whole study is is just divided into two papers, and uh, and basically, uh, and from my point of view, any regimen that has obligate radiotherapy is dangerous because uh, Hodgkin's disease is a disease of young people, and uh, if you radiate them, then you've got to wait for 30 years before you'll see the toxicities and to the heart, to the second cancers, and all the radiation toxicity we're trying to avoid. And uh, uh, so I think Stanford 5 went down for the count, as they say. Because Stanford 5 was intended yeah. as, as a more mild uh, oh, regimen. It, yes, or, and it was, uh, had very interesting early results from Stanford. And then the, the Italians tried a randomized trial and showed it to be inferior. Uh, and, um, but the radiotherapy wasn't exactly up to Stanford, Stanford standards. Uh, then the British National Lymphoma investigation did a randomized trial and they had better radiotherapy and they showed it was equivalent and published it. And the Ameri North Americans have gotten around to showing their data at this meeting, which confirms it even further. So basically it's a horse race between the two. And for my money, if you don't have to radiate somebody, just give them chemotherapy, you are in a young person sparing them the risks of lifetime risks of radiation toxicity. How much then has therapy for Hodgkin's disease improved in your view? Well, since I got into the field dramatically from almost 10% uh, survival to now uh, way up in the 75 to 85% survival. And that's with uh, ABVD mainly? Well, with, with, with MOP and, and ABVD, with better radiation, uh, all of it better staging. Uh, it's, it's a very curable disease. Of it's course, very there's a BCOP regimen regim that uh, yes, Falka Deal, who won a prize yesterday as well. He did, and it's a more intensive regimen, and again, appropriate for the circumstance where you need more intensive chemotherapy, like a very high-risk patient, but fortunately, most people who pitch in the door aren't high-risk. So looking at these studies, uh, examining Stanford yes, 5, yes. Uh, the bottom line message for doctors is that they shouldn't use it anymore then. Is that, are you saying that? It's, it's equivalent, and if they wish to use it, they could do it. They're not depriving the patient. But for my money, I wouldn't do it because of the fact that they have to irradiate a lot of people. The 75% of the patients in that study were irradiated. In the Stanford study, originally it was 90% of the patients were irradiated. So, um, I, no, I wouldn't use it. And you can now avoid radiation and avoid the long-term consequences in, in younger patients in, especially? In most circumstances, in the patients with very bulky disease who with chemotherapy still can't be rendered free of disease, the PET scan is still positive, those patients will require radiation. And I think what we're getting better at, and there'll be and there are probably enough posters and, and biological studies here, that uh, the CD68 uh, immunohistochemistry study on the tumor showing that whether the CD68 is present will predict that that patient will have a tougher time with uh, uh, localized therapy, usually just chemotherapy. But um, it, it may be a way of identifying patients who will require either more intensive chemotherapy or radiation.
Mm. Now, their local ice in, in something of the same vein, but a different disease. Yeah. I know at the session that, you, that you've been yes. at, uh, Craig Moskowitz from Memorial Sloan yes. Kettering in New yes. York, he had a very encouraging study on large cell lymphoma. Could you tell yeah, me what, well, what you've heard there? It's a, an entity known as primary mediastinal large cell lymphoma. Uh, it's almost a separate entity amongst the, as compared to nodal large uh, cell lymphoma. And it's a disease of young people, uh, like Hodgkin's, and has some genetic relationships to Hodgkin's, but it's not Hodgkin's. And what he showed was <clears throat> simply that if you intensify the chemotherapy, what he did was offer a rituxan chop uh, every 14 days times four, and then he consolidated that with a, two cycles of a regimen known as ICE, ifosamide carboplatin etoposide, and didn't irradiate the patients. Um, and uh, they looked at their PET scans, and if they were negative, they would not radiate the patients. And they had a phenomenally good, good result with an 88% survival rate. It's a cure rate, isn't it? Yeah, it's and a cure. Young a, women. These are young women, spared of radiation. They have again. a lot to gain. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I must and that was you. very interesting because a lot of people, uh, a lot of practitioners still irradiate these patients. And I think that, uh, I think people ought to pay attention to this kind of uh, data. So and this is the triumph of chemotherapy. You yes. can get Speaking rid of Speaking as a chemotherapist, it is the triumph of <laughs> chemotherapy. But, but now, it is. It let, is. let me dip in. Uh, let me try, try some of these on you, George, if I may, because um, uh, there's, there's this agent called Brentuximab, which mm. I think you, you, you've also found quite interesting. It's SGN35 in refractory and relapse Hodgkin's yes, disease. Yes. Yeah. Paper by Robert Chen, City of Hope. What came up there? Well, there are several SGN studies around. One was published in the New England Journal. There is a poster. I think there's this presentation. Well, what it is is a immunotoxin. It's an antibody directed against a marker on the, on the malignant cell of Hodgkin's disease called CD30. And it's linked to a tubulin poison called oreostatin. And uh, it's it binds to the tumor cell. It's taken into the tumor cell. And this oreostatin with it uh, chews up the tumor cell in some way, probably destroys the tubulin, and um, it's pretty free of toxicity. Now, immunotoxins have always been attractive because of their targeted ability. It is very much targeted the, therapy. The missile, yes. As, as it were. Yeah, well, yes. But what did Robert Chen actually manage to do? What, what is he reporting here? Well, he's reporting, he reported, and all of the reports are, that this is active to the order of up to 80% of the patients will say, uh, obtain some benefit. That's in now, most of these, Hodgkin's right, disease. These are mostly end of the rope type patients. Uh, and so something that is non-toxic, especially to the bone marrow really, uh, it may be toxic to nerves because of the tubulin poison, but uh, it's going to be combinable with chemotherapy. Uh, and there's another paper on the same agent, SGN35, with, from Andre Shustov at the Fred Hutchinson, yes. and that's in anaplastic large cell lymphoma. What's the story there? Well, that's a large T cell lymphoma that also has CD30 on its surface. It's a rich CD30 tumor, and it, you would expect, and it does, bind, and it's even more effective in that disease than it is in failed Hodgkin's disease. It's kind of interesting. But we've got news also, finally, let me ask you about this one, an oral agent, a panobinostat. Um, Anna Sereda from Barcelona yeah. was talking about H a Hodgkin's That's disease That's one of a big family of drugs called histone deacetylase inhibitors. And the hope there is what? Well, the hope is that it'll provide some anti-tumor activity. And she showed that about 30% of the patients with failed, failed Hodgkin's disease uh, uh, could uh, get a remission, uh, albeit temporary, uh, with this uh, histone deacetylase inhibitor. Now, there are a host of such drugs coming along, and one may be better than the other. There's one, ro ro Romidepsin, uh, which has been approved for T cell lymphomas. Uh, it's on the market now, uh, for example. And uh, I think that's a whole field that's going to evolve, and hopefully, better drugs will be found. Now, the histone deacetylase inhibitors prevent deacetylating of the histones, and that allows for the expression of enzymes um, and genes and enzymes that facilitate the death of a cell, the apoptosis of a cell. And it, they may have a, a, they will have a role. Uh, whether you can combine them with uh, chemotherapy it remains to be seen, because the platelets do drop with these uh, drugs. Mm. Then we'll see. Uh, it's. 
George, that's a, a fascinating look into some, some, just some of the topics you've dipped into here at the American Society of Hematology meeting. What sort of message would you give to cancer doctors? Is it a, an optimistic message at the moment keep, coming keep, out of keep, here? Keep hoping. That, well, I think that man's scientific knowledge, which has expanded over the last 30 years ex logarithmically, is now finally paying off. You know, you, you, you've got antibodies, you've got immunotoxins, you've got histone, I mean, you've got all kinds of new things coming along. Eventually, they will hit. We, know, we've also heard here that uh, some of these therapies need to be used differently or considered for older patients who may have comorbidities, for example, and that <coughs> many of the studies in the past may not have been addressing this. What well, would you say to doctors about this? Well, I think the cytotoxics, I think all practicing doctors who give chemotherapy realize that older patients are more vulnerable to the side effects of chemotherapy. And unfortunately, or, uh, they shave the doses um, they they redu reduce the relative dose intensity, and the results are not as good. Uh, the more we have, uh, let's say, less toxic drugs, the best example of that is actually in the large cell lymphomas that um, were presented here some years ago by Quadfier, when they added rituximab to the CHOP regimen in old patients uh, and uh, showed the marked improvement over chemotherapy alone when you add rituximab, which has no basic toxicity. So how much scope do you think there is in improving therapies for older patients? Oh, I think there's a lot of room. Uh, the safer the chemotherapy, the, the better you're going to get. And so there will be less intensity, well, let's say less tendency to modify doses, to, to uh, change things like that. Uh, and if the drug is effective, then you will benefit from the effectiveness of the drug. Um, but you have to remember that there is comorbidity as well in older patients. They have heart troubles, they have secondary cancers and other things. And so that you can't change. What you can change is the tolerance to whatever is appropriate treatment at the time and by adding, if you will, a non less toxic drugs. And I think that is the great crusade to find uh, agents that are targeted to a specific known lesion in the malignant cell that will do the malignant cell in without doing the patient in, basically. Mm. And eCancer Television will, of course, be attending the forthcoming meeting in Rome in, in March in 2011. I hope you'll be able to make it too, George. Yeah. But meanwhile, thank you very much for Not being on eCancer TV. Glad to be here.